Hi everyone, welcome. We'll get started here. Hey, my name is David Coulter. I serve as Chief Technology Officer for Sob Labs. And at Sob Labs, our focus has always been creating high value codeless integrations and extensions for vRealize automation that are easy to consume and manage. And this is our fourth iteration of helping customers transition VRA extensibility scenarios smoothly from one major version to another, dating all the way back to DCAC 4.5, which was pre-VMware acquisition. And we're excited to be a, a continue to be a major ecosystem partner for VMware and to offer our customers a glimpse at our own next-gen platform. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Sid Smith, who will walk you through our findings and our recommendations for VRA 8. Uh, thanks everybody again for your time. Hey everybody. We're gonna start by taking a little bit of a look at VRA 8 and what it's gonna to take to get there. And some of the things that we found about transitioning to it in this early stage, and then move on to how we can help our customers or help VRA users through that transition. So in part one, we'll do uh, some VRA analysis and findings. We also have some blog articles that we've written on some of this in more detail. Then we'll move on to our part two, which talks about our next gen platform and how we can help migrate our customers from VRA 7 to VRA 8 using our policy migrations. <clears throat> and then in part three, we'll talk about a case study from a organization, a large healthcare provider that we've been working with to help prepare them for PRA 8. And then we'll end with some questions and answers. <clears throat> uh, doing the introduction with David Coulter, our CTO, he introduced himself. We also have uh, Mike Wasserman, our VP of Sales on with us. And of course, myself, uh, Principal Solution Architect Sid Smith with Soft Labs that'll be taking you through the presentation. So first, let's start with the VRA analysis and findings. One of the things that's great about VRA 7 today is it has a significant amount of uh, documentation, community support, published best practices, and things like that. With the introduction of VRA 8 at this point being so early on, we found that it just doesn't have that level of support yet to really be able to help organizations get to where they need to get to. Whereas VRA 7, there's literally hundreds of blog sites dedicated to sharing info. So far, there's only been a handful uh, that have spun up for VRA 8, and even the content that's coming out is very limited. Uh, there's a vast community of VRA 7 experts. A lot of organizations have been running VRA 7 for many years, even prior to 7 going into 6. With VRA 8 <clears throat> being basically a net new platform, the community is just beginning to learn that platform and understand where all the moving pieces come into play and, and where everything fits. The uh, best practices for VRA 7 have been pretty much tried and true at this point. A lot of organizations have done the work to figure out what works, what doesn't. VMware has published uh, lots of best practices based on these experiences and that really guide the community into building out these reliable VRA 7 environments. And realistically, there's just not enough real world use to establish these best practices for VRA 8 today. Aside from the community support documentation and best practices, there's also uh, available out of the box integrations. A lot of third party vendors had produced their own integrations for VRA 7. Uh, the community had also produced a, a significant amount of uh, integrations as well as third party. Uh, companies like ourselves that build out-of-the-box integrations for VRA. These are just really um, <clears throat> getting started at this point. Most organizations or partners didn't have early enough access to the VRA 8 code base to really begin to build these integrations. And there's also some features with VRA 8 that just aren't available yet uh, to be able to build some of these, these uh, integrations. So there is some limited out-of-the-box integrations that do come with VRA 8. Uh, for example, InfoBlox happens to be one of those integrations, but it does lack some of the enterprise features such as validation uh, to ensure that those IP addresses aren't used. And this is very similarly the case that we see for 
uh, a number of those integrations that come out of the box. Uh, they're basically minimal viable integrations, right? Just getting you the basics that you need to get that up and running. Uh, there's also Ansible Core comes as one of the out of the box integrations. However, uh, this there's no support for Ansible Tower or AWX. It's just simply Ansible Core, which gives you that ability to do basic script execution or Ansible job template execution. So again, fairly limited in, in what it can provide. And, and very similarly with Puppet, um, there's some limitations to, to what can be achieved with these out of the box integrations uh, that ship with, uh, or that can be uh, added into VR88. So third party integrations, as we kind of talked about, there's over 300 plus for VRA7 supported today that you can download from the marketplace. And then there's even more that you can get from uh, independent vendors' websites and, and such. Whereas for uh, VRA8, there really isn't, isn't any available. The marketplace hasn't even quite been um, populated to, to be able to support those other than the ones that come from uh, VMware directly. There's again over 300 uh, community customizations available. If you look at the VMware sites for um, uh, for code.vmware.com, um, so there's there's tons of, of community support that that can help give you even um, community supported uh, integrations that you can take and modify on your own if needed or use as is to help extend VRA. Again, the community is just beginning to learn about VRA eight, so there's there's very little available there. <clears throat> When we start talking about migrating from VRA7 to VRA8, one of the, the key things to, talk, to, to think about with VRA8 is there's no VRO plugin for VRA8 like there is for VRA7. So these existing customizations within VRA7 realistically gonna have to be rewritten. Uh, and, and this is just one of the factors that, that come into play, but to, to connect to VRA8 from VRO, you're gonna need to use the REST plugin as opposed to uh, a VRA plugin that shipped with VRA7, making it very easy to connect and consume uh, what VRA has to offer. So there's going to be a slightly new learning curve for doing this. So it's an entirely new API. So if you're familiar with that VRA7 API, the API for VRA8 uh, is significantly different and currently limited in functionality. Uh, so again, not yet as robust as the VRA7. Uh, the provisioning API in VRA8 is private. So as of today, you can't get access to that provisioning API, uh, which could pose some challenges as well. If we look at the event broker that exists within VRA7, uh, there's been <clears throat> uh, schema changes to 8. It's essentially been completely rewritten. So the schema that you're potentially built your integrations around for VRA7 is no longer the same, which means, again, uh, another reason as to why those integrations that you might have today will need to be rewritten. The EVS workflows are no longer uh, using the payload. Now it uses something called input properties, which doesn't necessarily give you access to all of the metadata uh, that was available in the payload. So not all machine properties are available in every state in the new EBS uh, schema that's provided in VRA8. So when we start to look at how these integrations were built in seven, being able to take that payload and having access to all of these machine properties throughout the entire life cycle of that machine, there was a lot of integrations built around that concept and that, that is significantly different uh, in eight. <clears throat> A lot of organizations also adopted XADS in VRA7. It was, a, it was a way to get more granular control over your blueprint requests. Um, of course, XADS has other uses such as standalone or, uh, or you know, non-machine uh, related uh, blueprints, but, but we've seen a lot of organizations using XADS to drive the VRA requests for machine deployments to get that, that additional granularity. This capability does not yet exist within VRA8. So if we look at what XS can do in VRA7, of course, having those XS blueprints that don't create catalog items, such as maybe an XS item to uh, go and add an AD user to Active Director, things like that. We have the blueprints that create those manageable catalog items, uh, day two actions or resource actions for VRA7, uh, ability to use custom resources, resource mappings, uh, as well as component lifecycle. 
and of course uh, being able to nest those XS blueprints uh, within VRA 7 as well. If we look at VRA 8 capabilities, it currently does have the ability uh, to do XS for blueprints that do not create a manageable catalog item, but as far as the rest of the XS capabilities that VRA 7 has, they don't exist yet in VRA 8. So if you're using those XS blueprints to get that granular control over those requests, it's not going to be possible in 8 at this point. Now, these are things that may be coming down the road, but um, <clears throat> for right now, this creates issues for many organizations in upgrading today and uh, making them have to wait until that 8.1 or 8.2 uh, release where these are potentially going to become available. So there's some things that we can do at Solve Labs to help with that transition. As David mentioned at the beginning of the call, this would be our fourth iteration of helping customers move from one iteration of VRA to another. And for anybody who was running the product back in some of the older versions like the 6.x, going from one version to the next can be a pretty significant <clears throat> upgrade, especially looking at VRA 7 to VRA 8, with the architectural changes and taking in consideration that 8 is a realistically a net new platform, this is going to be a, a really significant, more of a migration than an upgrade, uh, if you will. Before we get into how we can actually help with that, that migration from VRA 7 to 8, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with what we do, I'll give you a slight high-level overview of where we kind of fit today with VRA 7 and then talk about where we're going uh, with VRA 8. So VRA 7 has the event broker and the lifecycle capabilities that we talked about here where we can uh, in interject into that lifecycle and execute different integrations throughout that process. So what we do at Solve Labs is actually make codeless integrations for VRA that are very easy to manage and that leverage this life cycle of the machine for customization and doing things like custom naming, integration with IPM, DNS, Microsoft Active Directory, F5 load balancers, things like that, as well as some other VRA add-ons to the sense of uh, VM tagging, DCR DRS, integrations for things like ServiceNow CMDB, Ants Tower, Puppet, Red Hat Satellite, and these types of things. All of our integrations are built to conform to this lifecycle, so when a machine is being built, they'll execute at the appropriate states, as well as when a machine gets destroyed, essentially undoing and removing these configuration elements from the environment. So if we need to remove things from Active Directory or release IPs into the IPAM, uh, I can do all of that. So basic high-level overview of, of what we do in seven. In seven, our integration <clears throat> is a VRO drop-in that's managed through VRA to provide these uh, integrations and extensibility items onto VRA seven. With VRA eight, our platform is changing quite a bit. We're actually becoming extracted from VRO and running as our, our own platform, if you will, outside of VRA itself. <clears throat> And this allows us to take all of these integrations and put them into a centralized platform, allowing you to simplify and standardize your extensibility consumption, as well as get some uh, centralized visibility into what is actually happening with those integrations. So <clears throat> if we start to look at <clears throat> what this means, the way we approach integrations in the environment is through what we like to call centralized policy management. So when we think about an integration uh, or, or customization, let's take host naming, for example, that naming standard, that naming convention that you may use to name the machines in your environment would become a policy. Or creating these IPM profiles that define your networks could become a policy. This allows you to create standardized policies around your, your different automation use cases around the naming convention that might need to be used for environment A over environment B, as well as the different networks available and, and what those networks should be used for, and wrap your business logic around these policies in your environment. And this gives us a single point of reference that we can use 
to approach these integrations that provide uh, the ability to drive them via metadata so we can drive them very dynamically based on information that we may collect from your requesters as well as information that we know about the environment. Uh, apply those with the policy and then something that we call our template engine, which is part of our platform to intelligently make decisions around what the outcome should be uh, for these integrations in your environment. And as I mentioned a, a few moments ago, for VRA 7, this is managed through the VRA interface. The plugin actually sits inside of VRO and, uh, and is contained within. But as we move forward with our, our next gen platform, these policies will be extracted up into our own platform and can be consumed from VRA 7, VRA 8, as well as VRealize Automation Cloud. So to give you an idea of how this plays into the migration of VRA 7 to VRA 8, ideally most of our customers today that are using our products already have VRA 7, already have policies in place. And they'll be able to simply take those policies, migrate those policies to our next gen platform so that they're now uh, in our, our platform and outside of VRA itself. So now that they'll be able to be consumed via VRA 8, potentially be realized automation cloud. The benefit to this is being able to do a migration without having to do a massive lift and shift. If we start to think about what it's going to take to migrate or transition current VRA 7 integrations to VRA 8, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, you know, we talked about earlier, the platforms are significantly different. There's things that are missing, like there is no plugin for VRA. The, the EDS has significantly changed. The schemas have changed significantly. So these integrations haven't been rewritten. If they interact with one another, if they have dependencies on one another, most of the time what we're seeing with customers is these are gonna to have to be done completely together on aid, uh, rewritten, and it's a big lift and shift. Being able to take one integration, rewrite it and move it over, is only gonna give you a limited amount of value on aid right away. And then when we start to think about things like those XS blueprints where you're using those to further refine your VRA blueprints, those concepts don't exist in VRA 8 at this point either. And they'll need to be uh, either somehow configured into VRA 8 or integrations will have to be developed in a separate way. When we talk about the Solv Labs modules, if we're running VRA 7 today, it looks something like this where when somebody requests the blueprint, the modules get invoked, the appropriate policies for this particular deployment are invoked, and a machine name might get generated. The appropriate IPAM or you know, profile gets assigned, a network gets assigned, IP addressing gets assigned, all that relevant network information, and then that can get registered in the DNS, so we can get that AD piece and, and, and some of the other components as well, depending on what's in use in your environment, it be TAG, DRS, Ansible Tower, and so forth. And all of these things could happen through the life cycle of the deployment of that machine. When we start to look at transitioning this from <clears throat> the current VRA7 platform into our net, our softlabs.next platform, where we're going to move these configurations and these integrations out of VRA7. We can do that in a very staged way where we're not doing a massive lift and shift. Because we'll be able to run them both in the same environment, we could migrate naming over and not have to migrate everything uh, that's in the environment. So you can take these off in little chunks and say, okay, we're going to move naming over to a new platform. Next, we're going to move IPAM, maybe DNS. And then right down the line, one by one, programmatically move your integrations over to our next gen platform with very, very little disruption to your environment. What the benefit to this is, is once you've migrated these integrations from being embedded in VRA 7 to our next gen platform, we're able to then 
when the integrations for VRA Cloud and VRA 8 are ready, simply point those to our platform and be able to consume those integrations in a very unified way across all of these different platforms. So it's, you know, likely that VRA 7 will exist in your environment for a good period of time, even after VRA 8 has been adopted. Once these integrations become available in 8, might start actually uh, deploying machines net new from VRA 8, but you still have all those machines that are being managed from 7 that at some point will have to be migrated over to these new environments. Those machines may have been built using custom integrations and being able to figure out how to manage that and, and reclaim those resources once they're moved over to 8 is going to take some time. So it's very likely that these environments will coexist for, for some period of time. The benefit with our modules on 7, those workloads that have been deployed using our modules, say for custom naming or IPAM, once those policies are moved to our next gen platform, if those machines were migrated to 8, those policies being attached, when those machines get destroyed, it'll be able to reclaim those resources very much like it did when they were being managed by VRA 7. So making that transition very, very smooth and very simple. So there's some other benefits to our next gen platform that we'll be releasing uh, next year. And that is, when we start to break down some of the challenges of an isolated environment, if we're say doing custom naming in each of these different environments, we have the potential for overlap. Managing your naming standards across VRA 7, VRA Cloud, VRA 8 becomes challenging because you either have to have different naming conventions for these different environments, or you have to have different blocks that, that, that segment them, or you run the risk of overlap with these namings and potentially hitting these conflicts. And that becomes even more compounded when you start looking at mo many organizations having multiples of these environments. So you might have multiple VRA7, multiple VRA environments, and, and it just compounds this problem. When we bring these into, a centralized solution, we're able to prevent these types of things from happening because it's all being controlled from one centralized naming standard that can ensure that we don't have duplication happening in the environment. And again, when you have those multiple iterations of each of these different versions, it extends out to those as well. So it gives us the ability to do standardized consumption across platforms. And of course, we're, we're talking about naming right now, but the same concept applies to all of these different varying integrations. IPAM, uh, for talking about uh, being able to apply uh, different I networks and IP address to different um, environments, even though you might be using a IPAM solution, it's still reasonable to, to, to see that what we see in environments is sometimes IP addresses don't get logged into those different IPAM providers. And so having forms of validation to happen uh, in that process becomes increasingly more important. So even if it's not recorded in the IPAM, having other mechanisms to validate if that IP is actually in use, and of course, DNS records and things like that as well. So if we take a look at a case study, um, this is one customer of many that we've been working with on, on the similar scenario, but so working with a large healthcare organization, this organization had 100 plus composite blueprints that they were managing in their environment. They also had dozens of custom XS blueprints that were used based on different scenarios, whereas one XS blueprint might have been taking in information and making a determination to one of two to three dozen composite blueprints would get selected based on a decision tree as part of that excess blueprint. Uh, of course, other logic and other integration included in that excess blueprint as well, such as business logic that, you know, again, determine the um, 
appropriate composite blueprint, but other things as well related to the business as far as placement and those types of things uh, were being used in that excess. And as we talked about earlier, those excess blueprints aren't supported in BRA 8 today. And even if they were, with the schema changes, they would have to be completely reconstructed and completely rebuilt for VRA 8. <clears throat> this customer also had over 30 custom EBS workflows that were being used to do various integrations or enhancements uh, within VRA 7, and many of them uh, were being used just to provide business logic uh, into the provisioning process specific to the organization. So some of the integrations they were using were Puppet, IPAM, ServiceNow, and of course other customizations for custom naming, uh, DNS, and Active Directory as well, all tailored around their custom business needs. So all of which would have needed to have been rewritten and retooled for VRA 8. So when we started working with this customer, this was going to be a big challenge for them. They want to make that move at some point in the future. They're you know, they're still looking at about 12 months out before they're going to be ready uh, to move to VRA 8, considering the significant differences between 7 and 8. But as they looked at their 7 environment, they started to realize the amount of effort and work that was going to be involved in getting there. And after having spent a number of years putting this configuration in place for VRA 7, uh, it could potentially have taken just as long to get them over to VRA 8 with having to retool all of these customizations, rewrite them, uh, and uh, potentially um, take into account <clears throat> the fact that they're going to be running 7 for quite some time. As they adopt this on 8, they may not be able to take the exact same approach. So then they would be managing two separate VRA environments with different varying integrations that might need to be modified or changed as their business process changes. It was going to significantly increase their overhead management of their automation in their environment. <clears throat> so some of the challenges they had was very difficult to manage this environment as it was in very 7. Uh, again, those business processes change requiring workflow modification. That was going to compound even more as they, uh, if they were to adopt this on 8. And uh, you know, so really significant management overhead in the environment. So working with this customer, we were able to start to displace a lot of these customizations that they had. So current state today, they're down to one composite blueprint as opposed to the over 100 composite blueprints that they had when we started working with them. This one composite blueprint <clears throat> is being dynamically driven by uh, the metadata that's fed into the request through our what we call our property toolkit, as well as uh, combined with our template engine that's part of our platform. So it allows us to build their business logic into the VRA configuration, <clears throat> which will transfer over to our next gen platform, as opposed to that business logic being written in blueprints, uh, uh, well, uh, VRO code, and, and in those workflows. We were able to uh, remove all of the excess blueprints that they had in their environment that were driving their request using a combination of the custom forms designer, along with our property toolkit, our template engine, all of that logic is just configuration within VRA at this point, as opposed to, again, that code in those custom workflows. <clears throat> So we implemented a number of our integrations, including our custom naming, IPAM, DNS, AD, as well as Puppet integrations. Uh, and they were used to move their uh, custom integrations into a codeless solution. And as I kind of briefly talked about earlier, we were able to give them the ability to do the dynamic driven outcomes. So having that single composite blueprint will greatly reduce the amount of overhead they're going to have just from managing the composite blueprints themselves for their different scenarios. And everything that's being deployed is being done very, very dynamically. So whether it's a Windows machine or a Linux machine, these things are being determined based on the 
information they're collecting from their consumers based on the application that they're actually trying to deploy, it's going to drive into that one composite blueprint what template should be used, you know, what customization specs should be used, how the machine's going to be named, what network it should be placed on, what DNS zone it should be registered in, as, and, and it, you know, down to the point where what puppet uh, manifest should be uh, attached to those requests as well. And there, there was a bit of other things that, that were uh, integrations that were happening there as well. And not to say that we replaced 100% of their custom integrations because we certainly weren't able to do 100%. But what we were able to do was significantly reduce the amount of integrations that they were going to have to move when they go to VRA8. The other thing they were able to do with some of their other custom integrations that were used to integrate into some proprietary systems and, and some uh, endpoints that we just don't support today, they were able to remove their business logic from those integrations so that when they do have to move those, they can focus solely on the technology part of the integration and not have to rebuild that business logic into those workflows. By taking that business logic, driving it through the configuration in VRA using our property toolkit and template engine, they could feed that into their, their custom integrations to also drive those very dynamically as well. <clears throat> so, with that, I think uh, we're good to open this up for any questions that anybody might have. Uh, on anything that we've shown where we may want to elaborate some or uh, get more detailed information. And if you guys want to post any questions into the Q&A area, you know, please feel free to do so at this time and uh, we'll go ahead and answer them. So I do see a question that around, um, is the policy management using a new platform outside of VRA? So the policy management we currently have in our VRA 7 platform today, but it is built, you know, it's part of VRA 7. It is a VRO plugin for our products that, that use these policies. The policies, are going to be able to be migrated to our next gen platform, which is a new platform outside of VRA. Right, so it's going to be our own appliance that runs in the environment. <clears throat> there will be a lightweight plugin uh, within VRA, which you'll have for VRA 7 or VRA 8, whichever platform uh, you've been consuming, that would talk to this uh, centralized uh, appliance that runs our net new platform that have your policies configured. This platform is also being built API first. So even if you're using some other tools that uh, you want to be able to consume these integrations from, you'd be able to do so using the REST API. And we're also working on endpoint uh, integrations for other things like Terraform uh, and other products as well. <clears throat> so, and that ties into this next question. What is this next end platform you have mentioned? So the, the next platform is basically taking our integrations, as I, as I was just saying, putting them into its own appliance so they can be consumed centrally from whatever it is that you want to consume them from, whether it be VRA 7, uh, Cloud Automation, uh, or VMware uh, uh, Cloud, for, or VRA 8. And again, these things can be consumed via the API or other endpoints that we've released as well. So giving you a way to not have to manage your endpoint integrations for each and every single different platform that you want to be able to consume them from. And I have another question. When do you believe 8.x will become a viable platform to start consuming along the lines of what I can do VRA 7 today? So that, that's a great question, and it's a very difficult one to answer. You know, VRA, uh, VMware is saying that there's going to be you know, some significant changes or, or in 8.1 and 8.2. Um, the, the promise is that 8.2 should bring parity for most things. 
at some point in the second half of 2020, but it's it's really hard to say exactly when that uh, that will be. Uh, another question is, will it be on-premise or cloud? So our appliance will be on-prem at this point. We uh, we are investigating and looking at uh, potential cloud, but the, it's very you know, when it comes to integrating and tying into all of these disparate systems in your environment, uh, that's not something that I think most organizations would want in the cloud today. So the appliance itself will be on-prem uh, at this point. When can we expect the solvelabs.next platform to be available? And when will it support VRA 8.x slash VRA cloud? So our target is around that same time frame as VRA 8.2, sometime in the second half of um, 2020, although um, that, uh, that could change. I don't know, uh, our CTO, David Coulter, is on. I don't know if he wants to elaborate on that time frame, but, but that's basically what we're looking at right now. Yeah, that's correct, sir. All right. Will this also fully support VMC on AWS? So, yeah, I mean, we have support for VMC on AWS today. There is, uh, I think, one of our integrations that's not certified for VMC on AWS, and that's just because they limited uh, some of the, um, the APIs that were available on VMC. And David, keep me correct, I believe it's vSphere tagging uh, is the module that wasn't supported, but I, I might be getting that wrong. But yeah, I mean, so just like running VRA on-prem, you know, you'll be able to use the plugin and communicate with the platform using VMC on AWS. It's just a matter of if there's any of our individual modules that may um, not have the APIs that it needs, like with that one example for today. Yeah, the uh, the limitation was uh, vSphere DRS. Um, some of the uh, yes. APIs in vSphere aren't exactly on par for private private cloud. Um, so the the I think vSphere DRS is is the only thing that's impacted from from us on the integration side. All right. So I have another question here. How about licensing for VRA eight? I've been told based on what my company uses today in year seven, we require an enterprise license to get features like agnostic blueprint and cloud provider. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, and this is a, a struggle with VRA seven today too, right? So a lot of folks have enterprise to be able to execute or use the software components to execute scripts and things like that. Uh, all of our, well, all of our modules today, except for one, do not require enterprise. Uh, we do have a, a version of the Ansible Tower integration that works with enterprise for doing the drag and drop capabilities on the canvas. But we also have Ansible Tower integration that does not require the use of Fury Enterprise. And that's going to hold true with our, our next gen as well. So it, it really depends on um, how the integration is gonna be consumed. But our goal is to try and, uh, you know, where possible, build our modules and our integrations to not require those types of upgrades to the, the enterprise or higher versions if they were to come out with uh, additional ones. And will your next gen solution support any other platforms other than VRA? Um, that's a great question. And so one of the things I was talking about earlier was being able to have a Terraform provider for our next gen platform. Uh, possibly uh, we're looking at um, Ansible Tower integration for the next gen platform. So uh, a number of different ways to consume these integrations from other platforms, even those uh, other than, than VRA. Absolutely. And again, always able to consume it via the REST API as well. There's uh, a lot to what we're doing in our next gen platform, a lot more than uh, we could realistically fit into uh, this webinar. But if you wanted to get a look inside what we're doing, we do have some demos available uh, that show some, some really, really interesting things, such as how we're going to move some of this business logic configuration from you know, how that's gonna be supported as to what we're doing in seven today and how that's going to be supported in our, our next gen platform. And to give you just a, a brief example of, of what that might look like, there may be configuration in VRA7 that's done via the custom property constructs that exist in there. Today we have property groups where we can um, 
through our property toolkit, we can make use of property groups in a much more expanded way than what BRA 7 uh, allows you to do with it. So one example of that is being able to take in a singular input uh, as part of the request in VRA and translate that through to a, a property group so that one input can become as many uh, or have, have a greater impact on your request. That one property can become many um, by doing that. And one of the things we're enabling is being able to take those that same concept and, and extrapolate that up into our next gen platform. So if somebody chooses, say, uh, this is going to be a production deployment for your environment. Well, production might mean a lot of different things to your different uh, integrations. It might mean something to how uh, the name gets generated. It might mean something else to the network selection. It might mean something to uh, the AD integration and so forth and so on. And you can define these. You'll be able to have those definitions within our platform itself. So the only thing you would need to tell us is, this is going to be a production uh, um, deployment, and we'll be able to relate that to the various different integrations based on that one input. Instead of having to send us, hey, we need a production name generated, we need to put this on a production network for X, Y, Z, and you know, having to define that over and over again, making it very, very easy to consume based on these policies. Uh, next question, will next-gen appliance have some high availability architecture, or will be just a single appliance, and absolutely, we are we are um, building it with high availability in mind. Um, again, to basically um, the standards that one would expect in an enterprise data center, and um, so yeah, we, we definitely uh, we, we don't want to um, build anything that's not going to uh, be enterprise grade, and that that translates through all the way to our modules as well. So some of the things that that we do with our modules, we look at naming, right? We don't just generate a name and, and look at VRA and say there's no other VRA machines with this name, so let's use it. Uh, we do additional validation today in seven where we can go and check DNS to see if there's a, a name registered in DNS. Uh, that, that's the same as that. And with our next gen platform, we're actually taking that to the next level by allowing you to define uh, things like naming validators, right? You might want to validate against internal DNS, external DNS, other VRA environments, things like that. So giving you the ability to make sure you're able to do the appropriate validations for, for the things that we're generating. And so when it comes to those types of features that you would expect in an enterprise data center, they're, they're you know, front and center with, with the way we're designing everything. Uh, how do I know based on my company's use case when we should consider moving to VRA 8? This is a question that many of our customers are struggling with. Uh, when to move, um, you know, it, it, it's gonna vary from one organization to the next, but if you're a net new VRA customer, if you're not using VRA today, and VRA 8 can, can achieve the use cases that, that you need, then there's, you know, there's no reason not to, to consume it today. But like most organizations, that have already adopted VRA 7 in one um, way or another. Some you know, have very, very elaborate, um, mature VRA 7 deployments, and it's going to be a bit of time before VRA 8 becomes a reality. It doesn't mean you shouldn't start deploying it, learning it, getting familiar with it uh, today, but for it to be ready to be able to support what we've seen, most mature VRA7 customers, you know, you're probably at least 12 to 18 months out, right? Um, because just lacking some of the features that are needed uh, today and with the transition it's going to take getting from uh, those integrations that you have in seven today over to eight. One of the things that we can help with is, and, and going back to the customer use case that, that we're talking about is, working and helping customers getting transitioned off those custom workflows today onto off the shelf out of the box integrations so that those become a non-issue for that migration from seven to eight and the only thing you then have to focus on are those ones that we can't help you with those customizations the customizations that we either don't have a module for um, that you'll have to then retool and rework 
Um, but that's, that could be a significant help, right? Because a lot of that business logic and those types of things that get it transitioned today, in that period between when it's going to become viable to go to eight, you can then focus on those ones that we won't be able to do out of the box and, uh, and, and really shrink that pool of what you're going to need to do. Can you share <clears throat> other reasons for why my company should separate out extensibility from being tied to our CMT? Well, it comes back to the example that we were showing where we have that decentralized model, right? Where you know, you're, if you're managing these integrations in each separate environment uh, inside of your CMP, uh, you know, and, and even your other tools that you might be using like ServiceNow and things like that, you could be, you know, you're managing one, those integrations all independently uh, for say, just generating a name, but you also run that risk of that overlap, right? Where these things start competing with each other and uh, that, that can happen very, very quickly in an automated environment. Do you have a solution to integrate VRA 7 with ServiceNow? My company uses VRA for lifecycle management, but ServiceNow is the request portal. Yes, we do have uh, a couple of ServiceNow integrations. Uh, we do have a service portal integration for ServiceNow that would allow you to consume and use uh, you know, VRA um, blueprints from within the ServiceNow catalog to use ServiceNow as your, your primary catalog. But we also have a CMDB module uh, that allows for those uh, record creations of CI records to be created within ServiceNow. And uh, the two together work hand in hand to provide some day two operations in ServiceNow as well, so that uh, you can provide your users not only with the ability to make those requests from ServiceNow, but to manage those machines from a day two perspective as well. And one last question I have here is, will your new <clears throat> platform support multiple personas? Um, at a high level, my answer will be yes, but I would actually uh, call out on David there to see if he wants to elaborate on what that might look like. Um, from a persona perspective, uh, I guess we're talking administrator or consumer, um, so or provider and consumer, that's, that's definitely there. One other thing that, that we're kind of identifying as a, as a separate persona in the next gen is the ability to, uh, for the endpoint uh, subject matter expert to manage the integrations themselves. So today, one of the challenges um, we've seen with customers is uh, the IPAM administrator, the, uh, the F5 administrator, the network admin, or you know, the uh, Ansible admin may not necessarily be the cloud admin or the same admin, um, or our architect that's in charge of vRealize automation. So it's, it's sometimes tough to, to get that subject matter expert to come to a CMP to build the, uh, the integrations. It's usually the other way around. A, um, you know, the, the cloud management uh, um, expert is trying to figure out the, uh, the, the endpoint tools and technology and build that in, in inside the, the CMP. So with Sov Labs Next Gen, we're actually servicing those SMEs uh, if they want to self-administer and manage um, and create their own services uh, using our Next Gen, then, then they can and those services can be consumed anywhere uh, via API. So, uh, and that's basically via the, the policies. So the same policy, which is the configuration of how you execute um, in, in VRA 7 today from Solve Labs is going to be, um, you know, uh, part of uh, the next gen as well. But it doesn't have to be limited to the, to the cloud admin that can configure, monitor, and manage uh, those integrations uh, that can actually be the subject matter expert as well. And we do have one additional question around what about the VRA guest agent? So even with our modules today, we have support for doing deployments and executing scripts uh, within VRA 7 that don't require uh, the VRA guest agent. I'm unsure as to whether or not the guest agent will exist at some point in VRA 8. However, even if it does, uh, we find a lot of organizations don't like to use it or be dependent on it. 
Uh, we do have something called our Lifecycle Components Toolkit, which allows us to invoke and execute scripts within those guests without actually using the guest agent. Uh, we can do things like slip into the VMware tools or SSH or use WinRM, uh, those different types of technologies to interact with the guest OS, so no agent be required. Nor would you re be required to have enterprise uh, to, to be able to execute those scripts within the uh, the guest machines. And it looks like that is all the questions that we have. And so with that, I think we'll give everybody back a little bit of time and uh, thank you all for, for attending.